how are you doing? Uh, not bad. Uh, just got done with a busy week and heading into another busy week. Hey, there's uh, there's a break after next week, though. Nothing big going on the week after next. <laughs> just, oh, just Christmas. <laughs> yeah, right. Just a nice, big, slow crescendo up is what yeah. we're doing here. Yeah, yeah, lots of good stuff going on these days. Well, we're uh, we're surrounded by worship services with our uh, season of Advent that we're in now, at least as we're recording this and Christmas coming up and everything. So a good time to talk about what's going on in the worship service. And and that's what our topic is, is what does the Bible say about worship? And this is part two, and we're going to talk about um, a little bit more than half or depending on how you measure it, um, the first part of the worship service. So um, I don't know where you want to jump in and begin, but uh, there's a lot to cover. We're, what, what we're planning to do, maybe I'll just give a little outline, is to follow um, in our hymnal, we have Divine Service Setting 3, which is, quote unquote, the classic or the oldest of, of the orders that we follow in our worship service. And it's not too different than the other settings that we typically follow in our Lutheran tradition, but um, its um, parts can sometimes be um, on the one hand, confusing. On the other hand, they can just become uh, so routine and pattern that we forget if we ever even knew what we're doing or why we're doing it. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through and see the scriptural basis for all the parts of the service that we have. Yeah, and it's, uh, it, it's uh, what as I was taught in seminary, our, we use divine setting three for a lot of our discussions at SEM, uh, the SEM, but you know, you have the service of the word and you have the service of the sacrament. It's two mountain peaks, you yeah. want to say, that's in the service. You kind of, you, the service of the word, we crescendo up to the high point, which is the, uh, which is the sermon itself. And then we kind of come back into the valley with the prayers of the church and offerings. And then we crescendo back up again with the, uh, with the institution, with our Lord's words of, of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. uh, and a distribution and uh, we kind of come back down again as we close out the service so we have two these nice two big mountain peaks that we're going to be climbing and discovering and exploring yeah right yeah ex excellent that's um that's a good way to um kind of introduce this because and I, i'm reading i got this this mammoth of a book here that came out um it's fun, kind of a funny story for uh, people who have bad sense of humor but the uh um the hymnal that we use in our church came out was it 2008 no it came out in 2006 because it was seven, right when seven, i started seven. the seminary and um so my my i remember getting my hymnal from my parents it was right when i moved on campus and my my parents gave me my hymnal and it's it's lost somewhere in a church in maryland so if anybody in maryland is watching this and they find a, a hymnal that's inscribed from my parents in the front i'd love to have it back someday but um, anyways, long story short, th this uh, was referenced, this uh, Lutheran service book, uh, Companion to the Services, or um, Lutheran service book desk edition is what they've called it in some places, was referenced in a lot of the resources that they supplied with the, the hymnal. But the, the thing was, is this wasn't done until just last year. So it took them about 13 years or 15 mm -hmm. years to get this done and having it in hand. It's understandable because there's this is so footnoted and researched and just uh, an exhaustive history of not just um, the worship service, but the historic worship services and where the parts came from, not just in scripture, but in, in uh, church tradition and everything. So it's kind of a, a, a mammoth of a resource. And I don't think I'm going to scratch the surface on it. But one of the things that I, I noted here just quickly on that commentary on the the two services that we have within the service on our Sunday morning, service of the word and service of the sacrament, when the Reformation came, one of the big things was to return to the word of God. So the service of the word was something that was novel in some ways. It was brought to the church, you know, that we're actually right. reading scripture in the worship right. services, not just doing the uh, communion mass, the communion service, but also proclaiming God's word and, and preaching on it uh, regularly and not just... And not just having communion, but having that word uh, spoken to us is a huge thing. And then maybe I'll just make another note here that hopefully will get us into it is uh, the, the very beginning part of the service, invocation, confession, and absolution. Those were even later additions to the service. And, and so we're saying this, and it might be like, well, why do we do these things? And um, the uh, 
maybe maybe we'll just start there. Why 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 were they later additions? I'll throw a boy. I you know that's uh well they were they were doing well, the, um, you mean the corporate the corporate side of the yeah, thing. yeah 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 it was uh you know there's a lot of discussion on why that took place and it is really a lot later addition. Uh, you know, I'm thinking early 1900 or early early 20th century, maybe. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure the timeline. I could find it in this I, book, but <laughs> I think some of it though was geared around the fact that um, you had the issue of circuit riders. I think that played a little bit, especially when they came here to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and then we went. Uh, then when you had because uh, confession and absolution was directly tied to communion. Yeah, right. So. When churches had communion once a quarter or once a month, people would line up on a Friday night. My home congregation in El Elmore did that. They would the church would ring the bells and people would line up at the at the uh, the pastor's office and they would come in, confess their sins, uh, show they their would, intention. They would for, announce for communion, yeah. Announce for communion and show their intention for receiving communion that coming Sunday. So right. it was uh, it was always directly tied with that. But over the years, uh, and I don't know what drove the corporate aspect, maybe the drive for every Sunday communion, maybe. I don't know uh, what the full motivation is, but it did transform into this, what we understand today as a corporate confession absolution. But right. we haven't done away with private confession absolution either. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what I was going to say is private mm -hmm. confession absolution was so regularly used even after the Reformation in, in the Lutheran church that 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 was understood to be a part of your, your life as a Christian, which it still should be. And I strongly encourage everybody to make use of private confession and absolution. Um, it's a powerful uh, thing, but, but yeah, um, I'm, I'm reading this, this book right now, Joe Streeter gave me this. Uh, um, it's about his, uh, I believe it's his great, great grandfather who yeah. um, I reached out to him because I found out that the, uh, the, uh, the founding pastor of Trinity married a, a Streeter um, and so I said, is this connection? He said, yeah, and I got a book for you to read. And so I'm reading through that right now. But in this book, he talks about he was a circuit writer in uh, in Ohio and in Wisconsin. And I haven't gotten through where all, all the places he's been, but but he would go around to different preaching locations, basically, usually in people's homes. And, and as he went, he would um, he, some of the places he talked about, people were um, out of the practice of announcing for communion, but but that was the practice. If people were coming to receive communion, they would have a conversation with the pastor. The pastor would ask them, what sins are you struggling with in your life? Or if he knew, he'd say, I understand that you're drinking too much. Is is this something that you're repentant on? And they're like, oh, I'm repentant. He says, well, then why haven't you changed your way? And very like hard uh, right. law on them, but always willing to handle that, hand that gospel to them as well to prepare them for receiving the sacrament. But but yeah, so whatever it was, and we could probably talk to somebody smarter than us to figure out that historical shift, but we've become much more, much less individualized in that confession absolution um, nature. And it's it's put in at the front of the service, which isn't a bad thing. It's a great process to go through um, to confess your sins, especially when you're taking it seriously. So hopefully uh, some of this conversation will help you uh, consider what we're doing when we get into the service itself. Well, it really comes out in getting getting into the service. Like we're going to be following setting three. If you got hymnals, it's it's on page one eighty four of your hymnals. But it it, it really the it, it's the uh, preparation really and the invitation to worship. It prepares our hearts for our need for Christ. Yeah, it really sets the tone for the whole worship service as we as a corporate body, as a body of Christ, and each of these congregations come forward and we all say together, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities. And right. it really, it really sets the tone. And anyway, I want to back up even a step further. Yeah. Most congregations will start with a hymn. Yeah. But, uh, you know, some type of hymn to prepare our hearts with music uh, as we go into that confession and absolution. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, that's maybe a good place to start is is with the hymns, because most I know Concordia starts that way. Trinity starts that way, our yeah. service. And then after the opening hymn, um, then we'll stand up and make the uh, invocation. And uh, that's that's um, so. So our hymns are are scriptural, scripturally saturated. So they're they're God's word set to song or, or telling of God's word to music. Um, 
So there's there's always uh, scriptural connections with our songs uh, that we use in in our our church services. So I don't, I don't know if we want to say much more about our hymns. No, I think it's just because uh, our hymns we sing them throughout. We have an opening hymn. Uh, most have a, a sermon hymn that preps you, you know prepares you for the sermon, and then you have a closing hymn. And and it, there's always a theme of the day based off the readings. We'll talk about that later. But all those things are working together to prepare you for the whole experience of the service itself yeah yeah and one of the things i've i've uh, used as kind of uh because we have a contemporary service here at trinity and i know uh concordia has had contemporary service and uses contemporary songs and one of the challenges is finding uh faithful contemporary songs and right, and right. you know what what do we look for in a a song that may not be um used historically in the church or that's new to the church and so this this rule of thumb goes for both hymns and modern songs as well. Um, that line could be blurry at times, but so one of the frameworks I've I've used is when you are singing a song, who comes to mind for you? Is it God or is it you? And and if a song leads you to think more about yourself um, and what you're doing for God, then it's probably not appropriate for worship. Now there are a lot of songs that lead you to reflect on yourself as the the person needing god's work and for you but if uh if a song's just pointing you towards yourself and you're you're just um imagining how good you look before god it, it may not be an appropriate song to use in worship no and it's uh yeah you find a lot with a lot of those type of songs too there's not a whole lot of scriptural basis for it they're mm -hmm. more geared towards the fact of of saying a few things a lot yeah yeah in some ways and uh, but one of the nice trends i do see because we have a a most of our service is traditional with a liturgy and hymnody but we also have some contemporary songs that we also uh, have there every sunday and one of the nice trends i do see with contemporary music is now they're taking old hymnody and putting it into contemporary music yeah or, or even modern hymn writers there's lots of right yeah so it's a nice trend it's going in a better way overall yeah. Yeah. which is a good thing but yeah there's there's a lot more uh, and i think for me yeah kind of to distinguish what's the difference between a song and a hymn if if you had to narrow it down I, i'm sure there's somebody smarter than me who's got a, a distinguish but the hymns typically have more substance to them they tell a lot more than just a, a few lines like you said that are repeated um often and and not, not to say there's anything wrong with a, a refrain or a right, repeated right. part of a song but but you you really can benefit from from getting deep into the text when you're singing so so after the opening hymn we we get into the invocation now yes. what's going on in the invocation here well it's uh where we come forward the pastor comes forward and he opens the name of the father son and holy spirit and uh with that uh yeah, i want to say invoking the name but in a sense we are uh, is uh that now that the that the Holy Trinity is it's it's the saint the Holy Trinity has placed his name upon you in your baptism is now reminding you of the fact that we are coming before the Lord as baptized Christians who his name has been placed upon us. Yeah. And now we are in his presence. Yeah, there there's something that I came across and I've studied the worship service many times, both in seminary and even before that. And um since for her for different things but one thing i came across today that kind of struck me i had i don't know if i've realized before but we're not calling on god's name when we do the invocation we're actually declaring god's name declaring yeah that's much and, better yeah proclaiming god's name and and i and i thought that was an interesting statement because this isn't us asking god to be here this is saying who we are whose presence we're in and, and I think that's such a beautiful thing. One of the ways I, I like to talk about the invocation is it's a sentence fragment that um, completes the sentence that began in your baptism. I baptized you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, so there we're picking up where baptism has brought us to the family of God. We're, we're gathered with God's family. So we continue that sentence in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And um, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And so we're, we're declaring this is being done in God's name. Matthew 18, verse 20 is that beautiful, uh, comforting statement that we have. Yeah. No, I like that. I like that word change to invocation or call or calling upon or to proclaiming because we know 
from the scriptures, wherever God's word is, he is there present. Right. And so as the word of God, the word and sacraments already there. Mm-hmm. As, as, as we get into the service of the word and the service of the sacrament. So we're, we're, already, we're only proclaiming what's the obvious, what's our, who he said he's already there. And I like that word change. Yeah. Much better. So, so, yeah. So, and then after the invocation, that's, that's when we get into what we kind of started with, with the uh, confession absolution. We, we started there. Cause like I said, this, this preface preparatory work, the calling on God, the, the proclaiming of God's name, father, son, and Holy spirit. And then, confessing our sins this is all approaching god approaching his word and so we we haven't even actually gotten to the service of the word proper here until after the confession absolution but in confession absolution we're we're um we're we're basically asking god to purify us so that we can be um in his presence uh hebrews 10 verse 22 says let us not dr- let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience yeah. and our bodies washed with pure water. And so that's, that's literally what we're doing here is we're, we're trying, we're asking God to clean us so that we can stand in his presence. And, and the, the reality is, is God is holy. He's perfect. And in order for him to be holy and perfect, he cannot be in the presence of, of imperfection and, and um, guilt. And so he removes that guilt from us through the confession absolution, bringing us into his presence as his, um, his ones covered by the blood of Christ. And one of the beautiful things too, is we do that right off the bat. You know, we don't wait to the middle, you know, some, some Lutheran traditions will have this confession Mm -hmm. absolution after the service of the word prior to the service of the sacrament. Right. I like us in the, from the old Saxon German tradition, we do that right at the very, you know, it kind of, it, or for the Missouri Senate really position is that we do that right off the beginning. You know, mm-hmm. as you're coming in, you're beaten up from all the, from your week and, and the, you're, you're in a sense dragging yourself into church, beaten up as a sinner. We deal with the most important thing first. Yeah. And, and yeah. I just like how we, and it also kind of, you know, with, with our confession itself, like I said, as I mentioned, especially their older one in, on page 184 in our divine setting free service, you know, we come, I a poor miserable sinner. Everybody says that, says that together in unison. Uh, that it's uh, no one's better than anybody else. We're all on the equal playing field here, so to speak. We have right. all sinned and fall short to the glory of God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's a very, um, yeah, the, the, those words that we use in the divine service setting three, especially they, they're they're not giving us any leg to stand on. We're we're completely. Yeah. We talked about Correct. this with the first segment. You know, when we come before God, worship is a prostration. It's a humbling yourself. It's bowing before God. And so we're we're leaving ourselves to the mercy of God and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And um, the good news is, we we know the answer to that. We, we know yeah. what he, he is. Uh, Psalm 124, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. and uh, Psalm 32, verse 5, our great ones for um, the confession. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So those those verses show up right there um, in our in our liturgy. Um, that's That's one of the cool things about the hymnal is it's got these um these verse markers right at yep. the the margins of of the pages here so we we see all along the the service at least when you're holding the hymnal where where these are coming from those are the two verses we use leading into the confession yeah and it's it, you know that confession it leads us to the really the good stuff next is where we receive absolution mm-hmm. which is really i think unique with lutherans um because you know we're, we're now we have a pastor who is called by a congregation to publicly exercise the office of the keys and one of those is to withholding the keys or or, uh, or giving that forgive or withholding forgiveness or giving that forgiveness on behalf by the stead of Christ right it's nothing a power in the, in the pastor himself but by the office that he holds he now declares and proclaims that forgiveness 
And the beautiful thing is there's no strings attached to that absolution. Right. You know, yes. as the medieval church said, okay, you are forgiven, but now you got to do X, Y, and Z to complete it out. There's none of that with the, the biblical understanding of absolution. Yeah, no, that, that's good. I, um, I, this book is too big. I should probably put it out of the way because I keep trying to find things I came across today. But the, um, <laughs> one of the things I came across there is uh, Walther's absolution. So Walther was the, the founding uh, president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And um, what was it back in 1847 or whatever when the Synod was founded? And so he, uh, he would, his absolution, and I think this was used in all of the churches at that time, would be my understanding, was um, very similar to ours, but he would add, I, um, as a called and ordained servant of the word, I forgive you all your sins that you are repentant of and that you desire the Holy Spirit to amend your life in the keeping of these commandments and uh, or something along those lines. So it actually gave some qualifiers there, which I think are helpful to realize because yeah, that's yeah. one of the, the problems of not problems, but one of the pitfalls, potential or temptations of, of corporate confession absolution is is you could be sitting there just going through the motions. You're like, well, yeah, I confessed my sins, but but it really calls you to take to heart what you're doing in that confession. Are you desiring your life to be different in that re repentance that you're confessing before God? And and if not, then this isn't for you. This absolution isn't for you. And 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 that's easier for a pastor to do in individual confession absolution, but in corporate confession absolution, you know, you're just throwing it out there. Um, knowing that God is good and gracious and God knows the hearts and, and it's going to land and be effective where where the, the heart is truly repentant and the Holy Spirit is working that repentance and, and receiving the gifts. No, I like the I like the the uh, the what you're wording on the qualifiers, because we have that even in our confession. I am heartily sorry for them and yeah. sincerely repent of them. Uh, and, and it's a, so I think that's why we probably don't have those qualifiers and yeah. absolution because it's stated in confession, but they're there. And I think you're right because it can become, uh, I hate to say cheap in a sense, I guess that maybe if I'm lack for better terms, but it can be taken for granted of just taken for granted, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. It's, it's yeah. one of those things where it can go in one ear and out the other without um, touching the heart that the Lord desires exactly. to restore. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. It's the with that absolution because again, it's it's. I remember a story. We had a uh, a family in Elmore one time come into the congregation, and uh, they first time uh, the pastor there came, Pastor Lutz. He did the confession and then he did the absolution. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They got up and walked out because it was just something so foreign that they never saw uh -huh. something like that before. But eventually, okay. over the years, they actually joined the church at Elmore and are faithful members today. But it's something that's unique, I think, with, with the Lutheran churches. Yeah, I've, I've had that conversation with a number of visitors and um, new members of Trinity that that's something they struggled with coming out of different uh, denomination backgrounds right. where, who are you to forgive the sins? And and that's the reality is it's not the pastor. It's the, the word of God that forgives the sins and the pastor is just doing what God told us to do work we're announcing the forgiveness. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that, and I always like to point out that, and you, you said it so well that a pastor is called by a congregation to publicly exercise these gifts, but these are gifts. This forgiveness of sins is something that the entire priesthood of believers, every baptized right, child of God right. can forgive the sins of one another and point them to the, the saving work of Christ where um, Romans five, verse one since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can point each other to that, but to do it publicly, that's what the pastor's job is. And so he's, he's the one who stands up and does it. We don't, we don't um, do, a, do a, uh, a lottery to see who gets to be the guy for the day. That's, um, <laughs> that's not how we're ordered. No, 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 that's, that's great. Cause now I mean, once we receive that absolution, now we are primed and ready now to really properly and liturgically in a liturgical sense now to to go into the service of the word yeah and yeah and we so do the, that with the, the, yeah do that begin so, with the introit yeah yeah the introit is literally the latin word for introit means entrance right entrance yes entrance so i i don't know if 
you do this. It's been a while since I've been at Concordia with you and uh, um, and here at, at Trinity at this point, we have a altar rail at this point during the introit, which we don't do every week, but, but it's at this point of the service where I'll step up to the altar to continue the service. And, and so it's the idea of entering into God's presence that, that the introit has. And, and the introit is um, traditionally a psalm or parts of a psalm or multiple psalms that we, we speak sometimes responsibly, sometimes you even chant it or sing it. Um, but it's an entrance thing, and it kind of draws back, if I understand or remember correctly, it's, it harkens back to when people were going to Jerusalem for the festivals and the feasts and the sacrifices, they would sing the psalms as they were going the psalms, up yes. to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, in many of the ancient churches, and you even saw this a little bit, uh, even at Easter time with many Lutheran churches, they would meet outside the congregation. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the ancient churches, and they would sing psalms and uh, different aspects of the psalms as they would come in and process, following the pastor into the church as the introit, in the sense of entering into God's presence. Right. That. And so this is how we still can, can continue on that tradition. Um, and I do the same thing at Concordia. I will start out, and once the introit begins, I will step up into the chancel area in a sense of not only myself, but I'm leading the whole flock. Uh, all of us are now coming into the presence of God. Right. With that. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a visual representation of we are all um, stepping into the presence of God. And, and so those words are there. One of the beautiful things about doing the Psalms in worship is uh, there's great uh, comfort in knowing that the words we pray in the Psalms are words that Jesus prays. And right prayed while he was on on the cross but it, during his entire earthly ministry but um on the cross in, in particular um it in um, mark 15 verse 34 at the ninth hour jesus cried with a loud voice eloi eloi lama sabachthani which means my god my god why have you forsaken me which is a quotation from the psalms and then luke 23 verse 46 jesus called out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, which is another psalm verse. John 19, verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing all was now finished, he said, I thirst, which, again, is a psalm verse. And, and so Jesus on the cross is praying the psalms, and, and we approaching this word of life that comes from the cross, we get to, to say these words. No, the psalms are just a great, the more I read them, the more I love them. We actually, on our non-communion services, uh, we've added an extra psalm reading uh mm -hmm. the response of psalm reading just because it's the, the especially the psalm that's appointed for that day we don't do it on communion sundays but on non-communion sundays we do and it's been really greatly received because it's just it, it's just uh as the psalms go you know it just it pours out the emotions of god's people yeah and and how they you know they come before god and to receive his love and forgiveness yeah definitely they're they're, they're great stuff it's uh one of the best books to turn to if you ever just want to spend some time in scripture and prayer is, is to go to the Psalms. And so we, we do that in our, our introit and um, uh, get into the, uh, the thing that follows the introit is uh, where are we at on page 186. Now uh, yeah. we get into the Kyrie, which uh, is a cry for mercy that Kyrie literally means Lord that's greek isn't it yes yes i believe so that's one of the confusing things of um of the uh service is part, some of the words are in greek some of the words are in latin and um we 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 speak english so it gets confusing um <laughs> but the uh the kyrie means lord so kyrie eleison would mean lord have mercy. mercy um and so there's so many examples i think the where's uh mark 10 verse 47 and in, in uh scripture is i think that's one of the leper stories if i remember correctly mark 10 good question um, i'm gonna beat you to it oh this is uh when he heard that it was jesus of nazareth he cried out um oh, the, uh, jesus son of david have mercy on me so this is blind Bartimaeus. Blind bartimus yeah 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 bartimaeus yeah because it's uh because it's it's important to note we're not actually coming back in and and seeking in a sense another confession absolution right i think it's more of a mindset that we're coming we're coming to the lord recognizing 
the source of all our help, our, our, our joy, our need, and our forgiveness, our source of everything that we need in life. Right. And this life and the life to come, we're coming before the one with our hands out, ready to receive what he wants to give us. Right. Yeah, definitely. That, and that's a, that's a beautiful thing. One, one of the pictures that we haven't really talked about, and uh, we're going to share a, a couple resources in our, our links or in the show notes, we'll have a couple links there, but, but one is uh, put together by uh, Pastor Lutz. He said we could share this, right? I'll ask him, but I don't think you have a problem. <laughs> I don't think I'll have a problem either. But anyways, we can talk about it and then we'll get his permission to share it. But but he he talks about how the worship service kind of echoes the life of Christ. And and yeah. really at the introit, um, we we see the the birth of Christ um as he enters the world. And and then following that, it's uh, a cry of faith that that we know God who's merciful to us and and we plead to him. But then right after the the Kyrie, we we go into the Gloria and Excelsis, and there it's abundantly clear that we're in that birth account, as in Luke chapter 2, the angels appear to the shepherds, and they sing glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. And that's exactly what we sing um, almost every Sunday at, at our worship services when we have the the um, this, this setting here. We're, we're re, reliving the life of Christ and, and revisiting these pages of scripture. And that was probably the greatest thing that I got out of reading that document that uh, Pastor Lutz put together. Put together is that, you know, it, in my years at in my years at seminary, you probably yourself, I never heard it described that way, as the liturgy is the life of Christ. Mm. We got more into the individual aspects of the different parts, but never looked at it to stand back and looked at it as a whole. It's right. how this reflects his life, his birth, and his. We move towards this passion as we get into the service of the sacrament. Uh, it's just a great, uh, I think if more people come to realize and see how that service played, I mean, see it from that perspective, I really believe they have a new different, a different, I guess, uh, I don't want to say this, a, a, a new uh, a new love for what's taking place there with the liturgy and what it's trying to show us and tell us. Yeah, and, and the thing I love about it is um, I think one of the, most appreciated but probably not realized that people appreciated things about being connected to a church in a worshiping community is the cycle of the seasons i mean just the yeah. anticipation of advent the joy of christmas the uh the revealing of epiphany and then the the somber uh reflective nature of lent and then the sadness of holy week and then the the joy of easter and then um end of the season of teachings and then you repeat the cycle all over again but we, we get that every Sunday, and it's cool when you see every Sunday, we get that on a small scale. We get this yeah, cycle right. repeated. And so when you're singing glory to God in the highest, get those Christmas feel goods in your, in your <laughs> mind. Right. And, and, I, and I think yeah. that's one of the best things you can do in um, your, your life with God is to, to not let it be boring, but to imagine all the goodness that comes around with it. And, and all of the stuff that, that is packed into these words is it's for our, it's for our good. You know, the old saying goes that mother is the repetition of, of all learning. A repetition is a mother of all learning. Well, you get that with this. Like, as you mentioned, you have the big circle of the church year, but then you have the, the small little weekly cycle of getting that same thing. But it's all repetitive. Yeah. It's the same way like when you tell your wife you love her every day. You know, she wants the, if you, the first time you don't do that, she's going to start asking, well, why didn't you tell me you love me, you know? what's yeah. going on it's the same thing as how god shows his love towards us through I, and i do believe the liturgy even though it's it's put together by man it has a a uh, a divine quality to it because it's founded on the word of god mm -hmm. the liturgical worship in, in in the book of revelation uh it, it's a tool by god i do believe that it, it leads and guides his people throughout their lives right in a sense yeah yeah, so that's uh, that's definitely there, and and you made a good point that maybe we should just mention is that this um, the service itself, the divine service setting three, is not in um, the Bible. It's not as if one of right. Paul's letters, he's like, now this is how you guys should worship. Um, but <laughs> but this has been developed through the history of the church to bring forth, and and I think we've kind of given a, a great reason why, because it helps us revisit on a regular pattern. The, the things that are essential to our faith and um this this i i love to see too um one of the assignments i give the eighth grade religion class here at trinity is to 
go through the worship service and draw an arrow up for the things that we are saying to God and draw an arrow down for the things that God is saying to us in the worship service. And sometimes the arrows double headed as God speaks to us through the hymns and we're also praising God in the hymns. So things like that can, can flow, but it's, it's awesome to see the back and forth as, as we literally dialogue with God, but primarily it's God speaking to us in the worship service. And that's the, that's the point I make with them is, is we're not showing up there in order to, give to God. We're we're going there to receive from God. And so the, the majority of the things that happen in the worship service are God's originated down towards us where we receive from him. No, that, that's a no, that's a great way to put that. You know, you mentioned how it's been developed and you can see how different cultures have brought in influences uh with our service, what we have today. Um just for instance, like we have what we the Lord have mercy to carry a liaison. That's Greek. It's Greek in its origin. Mm -hmm. um, it came really prominent in the Greek speaking church. But then we end the service with the Aaronic blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. You know, where they have the Hebrew, the, the its original synagogue and going back to the times of Moses. Right. Um, it, it's just, it's a, it's a all encompassing uh, ecumenical in a sense, if I dare use the term. How in the dare sense you. Of, of all of God's people uh, bringing, uh, adding this richness to our worship, worship life. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, so we're, we uh, kind of uh, plateaued out there on the glory and excelsis. And um, after that, we get to the salutation and the collect of the day. Um, and so the, the salutation is, is where the pastor says, the Lord be with you. And then the congregation says, and also with you or and with thy spirit. Um, what's going on there? Well, it's just a greeting between the pastor and the congregation. It, yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's the uh, the pastor greeting again. and But it's the, also the congregation uh, receiving and in a sense of reaffirming his call to that congregation. Yeah. Which is yeah. a beautiful thing. I, I, I love that that reality, and that's that's what I'm thinking of as the pastor while I'm up there is uh, when the congregation says, "And with thy spirit," um, I I've I don't know where I was first taught it, but yeah, it's understood that that's an a reaffirmation of um, you are um, doing the spirit's work here, and and may your spirit be aligned with God's work here, and and the words that you uh, speak to us and the proclamation that that you as a pastor give. So, yeah, that I, I like. Uh, Pastor Lutz's notes, I, I don't know the um, the reference off the top of my head, but it, this was a greeting used by Ruth and and then uh, and then Gabriel, we know the the Lord be with you um, yeah. so that it's it's got these biblical origins in it again. And it's uh, it's more than just a, a hello. How are you doing? But it's a reminder of our our place in God's family. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 2 Timothy 4, verse 22 is the, the passage that's cited in the uh, Lutheran service book for this one. And that's where uh, Paul gives this greeting, the, the Lord be with your spirit and grace be with you all. Is, um, I think it's his parting parting notes there in uh, right. 2 Timothy. But then we get to the collect of the day, which I like to do the play on words to remember what it means. But the collect of the day collects the thoughts, the themes of the readings collects them into a prayer. And so collect is technically a, a word that means prayer, but but here we have the collect of the day. This is a, there's um, there's one for each day of the church here, one for each of the festivals. And these are historically developed prayers, but um, it's kind of cool that we share a lot of these collects with, um, just like the lectionary, these collects are tied to the lectionary. We share these collects with uh, the ecumenical church, if if we can use that yeah. again. So yeah. our Catholic brothers and sisters, Presbyterian churches, Episcopal churches, liturgical congregations are often saying the same collects because they've been around for centuries and um, they they kind of grab all of the reading senses and, and put them into a petition. It's kind of neat to notice that there's always a pattern to the collects that we start out by addressing God. I'm taking from your notes now on this one. Yeah. And, and yeah. then we... We, um, we say something good about God or a, a basis from prayer, a basis for the prayer, something that we have. And then we actually petition God, ask him for something. And then we, we give a reason why we need that. And then we conclude with the, um, 
for you are with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know, basically that um, Trinitarian uh, conclusion to the prayer. And, and um, so they follow a pattern and you can always break them apart. It's probably best heard if you've ever been in a uh, setting where you hear it chanted. Um, that's one thing we learn in seminary is how to chant the collect of the day. And you actually change the tone based on which right. part of the prayer you're in. Um, and I, I'd do it for you right now, but I haven't done that in a long time. But it's, <laughs> it's kind of neat to notice that when that chanting is taking place, you're you're acknowledging God. And then you're asking for something that you need from God, who with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you're concluding going back to God. No, it's, it's awesome, too, because there's also, you mentioned the ecumenical aspects of this, but there's an antiquity aspect too with these colics and many of these colics that we still say have been updated for language sake and such but they go back centuries yeah so your great 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 grandparents <laughs> right. might have been praying these in church or hearing the same them ones, right? yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool so um after the collect of the day we go into the scripture readings right and yes. um now, what do you want to say about the scripture readings? What does the Bible say about scripture readings? <laughs> <laughs> well, boy, uh, read them often. Yeah, and, and especially in church. I'm going to summarize it for you. Um, but no, again, it, it sets the uh, the readings. It's, it's uh, not only do we have the liturgy based off scriptures, but now we're actually getting into the word of God itself. And, and for us, we do use a lectionary. There's a, a three-year lectionary and a one-year lectionary, historic one year. Um, both are great in their own, have their both strengths and, and such. And, uh, but it's, it's again, bringing people back to the word of God, bringing the word of God to the ears of the people. Mm -hmm. Um, and it did, but you're ultimately, you're kind of, you're building and prepping the people for what's going to be proclaimed in the pulpit. It, it's right. working towards the, you're, you're, you're going up that mountain heading up to, for the sermon. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's, I, I don't want to get all the way to the sermon yet, but yeah, when we have these readings, there's um, the, the task of a pastor, you know, is to to take these readings. And then Nehemiah 8, verse 8 is one of my favorite preaching verses to think about um, where uh, Nehemiah, um, oh, I, I should get my Bible. Nehemiah open. 8. You got Nehemiah 8, verse 8? I don't have it, but it's Nehemiah 8, yes. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Oh, Amos uh, Obadiah, Ezra, Horatio. Nehemiah. No, I'm sorry, it takes me a while to get to my. <laughs> Ooh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. I always get thrown off because Nehemiah timeline is towards the end of the Old Testament, so I'm always looking yes. back at the Minor Prophets and like, oh, Nehemiah is not there. So Nehemiah eight verse eight says uh, that they were they read from the book of the law of God which would be the, the Pentateuch or the first five books of the Bible. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that people could understand what was being read. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what the sermon is. And so we have these, these readings that we, we cycle through and we follow both of our churches, follow the three-year lectionary. Some of our uh, Lutheran brothers and sisters follow a historic one-year lectionary. And um, there's, history behind that too it's not as historic as a three-year lectionary but anyways the um the uh the readings are there to to give us uh, a a fresh word of god a perennial word of god really and and the thing that i i love about being a part of a liturgical church is that we follow the lectionary it's not up to me to to say all right which of these books and chapters am I going to bring to bear for God's people? And that's not to say that can't be done well and done healthy. And, and you know, sometimes past we, we do go into a series where we understand the congregation is going through a time where we might need a teaching that's pertinent from a place in scripture. And so we'll go off the lectionary. But I, I, I just think it's such a great thing to be kind of forced by this system that we're in to look at the text that we might not have gone to on our own and say, all right, what is God saying to us this week from this text? And and every every week we get a new a new set to look at. Well, it, it's uh, and what's unique too with lectionary churches that you know, and kind of goes into the sermon a little bit. But those of us who do it, there's it gives us the opportunity for a little bit more doctrinal preaching or systematic system preaching on systematics. And and what does this 
texts mean from a dogmatic or, or a theological perspective and, and for our salvation. Whereas sometimes when you have other congregations or other church bodies that this will preach through a whole book, which is great too. I'm not going to knock that. It's more of an expository type sense, but they don't do, they don't have those readings where you're not hearing those things. So a, a congregation from that tradition will maybe be stuck in the book of Matthew for three years. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and there's only we, so many themes that Matthew right. touches on. Yeah. Or, exactly. So yeah. we're getting, uh, again, that, that repetition you mentioned earlier with the, the cycling that yeah. happens on a yearly basis and on a weekly basis happens also with our readings. Right. Yeah. So the, the readings themselves, we get an old Testament reading um, most of the time, and then we get an epistle reading most of the time, and then we get a gospel reading every time um and so the uh sometimes we get a first reading which is um during the easter season it's from the book of acts right and uh oh. and then during the um sometimes the epistle is is not uh from the letters as well but but we have uh these different readings that that we drive through and we we hear god speak to us and and that's that's probably the best thing to to lean into it and at this point is the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Uh, Psalm or Isaiah 55, verse 11, the word of the Lord does what it's sent to accomplish. It doesn't return void. And so here we're, we're this is God's, this is a mean of grace. This is one of the ways by which God delivers his grace to us is through his word. So it's, it's a central part of our service. And it goes back to the, um, the early church we even see in scriptures that uh, Jesus showed up in the, the synagogue where I just had that passage up here in Luke chapter four. He came up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He enrolled and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hear hearing. So this is this is why we read scripture. It's, it's what Jesus did when he went to church. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, no, it's uh, exactly. And it's I'm glad it's, uh, it, and again, though, too, is this is all building up towards the sermon. You know, mm -hmm. it's all interconnected because we get there at, at, at the sermon, we get to give the sense of the text. We get to explain all that. But uh, what's interesting, too, is also with, I don't know how much you want to spend on here, but I'd like to kind of get into next where Junique will always have a sermon hymn, though, that mm -hmm. kind of ties in a lot of times, you know, a lot, because we don't, a lot of times don't preach on just one text or all three right. texts. We'll either pick the gospel or epistle or Old Testament. So a lot of times we'll move into the, to the, we'll have a sermon hymn that's going to be based off the text that we're going to be preaching on. Mm -hmm. Again, it kind of it, it preps the people for what they're about to hear from the pulpit itself. Yeah, and really, only the, and hymns are a great and another great tool with that because our hymns have, have a deep substance to them based off scripture. If you look at the, you open up your hymn and look at the bottom, every stanza of a hymn is based off some type of scripture in the Bible. Yeah. And so it does a great job of prepping us for what's about to be proclaimed from that pulpit. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. That's uh, that's awesome. So uh, we've got through the sermon hymn. So as we're doing the uh, um, the divine service setting three, um, are we going to do the um, we're going to talk about the creed before we oh, talk yeah, about the yeah. sermon? Yeah. Let's, let's just talk about, I think what's, what's probably, Time-wise, do you want to just uh, go to the creed and then work into the sermon next week? This might be a four-part series instead of a three. Nah, yeah. we can squeeze we can squeeze it all yeah. in next week. But all right. no, yeah. So we and 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 I so just yeah, I guess real quickly on the creed, and we'll end there. And because uh, we've already said quite a bit about the sermon, unless you got a yeah. couple points, we'll, we'll 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 only take five more minutes of your time here today. Uh, but yeah. the um, the creed is is I I like to think of it as now God's spoken to us. And this is one of the points when we do the creed, this is the arrows pointing back up to God or, or to the world around us is, is something I like to point out is that we're saying this creed, not just to 
acknowledge God to God. We're not confessing God to God. He doesn't need that. What, what we're actually doing is confessing him to the world and, and to our fellow believers. And, and um, saying it out loud is, is also reminding ourselves of, of what we know about God. So God has spoken to us. And now we say what we believe about God, and it's it's a response to God's word. It's fueled by God's word. It's spirit driven. This faith that He's given it, we now confess. Right. And what the creeds too, you'll see a lot of times with at Concordia, we have a we have communion services and non communion services. Mm -hmm. And on those communion services, we'll we'll recite the Nicene Creed, which defends the the Trinitarian nature of who God is. And yeah. on those non communion Sundays, we we. Uh, we recite the Apostles' Creed together. Yep. We have this yep. back and forth from week to week. Yeah, yeah, we we do the same thing here. It's a, a nice nice pattern, and um, and that goes again back to traditions of of the church that you know the Nicene Creed is or, or the Apostles' Creed is traditionally the baptismal creed, and so the Nicene Creed um, says more about the person of the Son. So we. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know exactly the etymology or the origin of that tradition, but it's something that we follow. I'll usually many times I will open up with like with the Nicene Creed. I said, now let us confess our Trinitarian faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. And with the apostles, I'll let us confess our baptismal faith with the words of the Apostles mm -hmm. Creed. Yeah, that's a good go way to back and forth that way too. Yes. Yeah. 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 And one of the cool things that I like about the creeds too is we're, we're actually rehearsing a defense um, for your faith. Um, and so if you're ever questioned about what you believe, you got it. It's in the bag. You've said it week after week or every other week after every other week for the rep, you know, the back and forth with the, the pattern that we just talked about. But but it's a great way to to be confident in what you say. And so one of the services we do, and I know you do it at Concordia, is the service of prayer and preaching, where we go through the parts of the catechism as part of that service. And so we'll say the Ten Commandments, we'll say the Apostles' Creed, and we'll say the Lord's Prayer. And so I'll, I'll preempt, I've, I've gotten in the habit of prompting those by saying, what are the Ten Commandments? Sometimes I'll say a little bit more, you know, the Ten Commandments show us our sin and, and uh, lead us to acknowledge our need for our Savior. Um, so what are the Ten Commandments? And then after we say that, I'll say, what do you believe? And, and, and it's just a great question to have the answer to, and that's what the creeds are. Right. No, that's, it's, uh, it, it, it keeps, uh, I like the point we talked about as a defense of what you believe if you're talking with somebody especially if you can get the if you can get the apostles creed as a mental outline in your mind uh in in that sense you can simply just recite back the creed in your own words to what you believe about the faith if you're sharing it with someone else mm -hmm. yeah yeah definitely so and then um so after the creed then we uh we got the sermon and you want to preach about the sermon or I think we've kind of said a little <laughs> what we did say well I think a lot of it uh it's one of those things that I I take to heart because I'm not a very good singer I'm not a you know there's things I don't uh there's gifts that I don't have but I put a lot of effort into preaching mm -hmm. uh you know a lot of our dogmatic or dog dogmaticians uh, of the Lutheran tradition in the Missouri Synod uh many of them have emphatically said the main task of a pastor is preaching it's the it's the one chance that you have to reach the most people at any given time. Yeah. From week in, week out. And it really is. And I do follow that. I think it's the, the Nehemiah 8. Again, you know, you read the text. I kind of do that. I walk through the text when I preach. I read the text. I give the sense of the text. I apply the text. And I don't confuse the law and the gospel. That's my her that's my homiletical uh position and how I preach and that's uh but it's a great way again to have that interaction um to proclaim that to the people and really uh it's one of those things too is, is when you're up there and you're preaching a sermon you're realizing that God is using the word of God using your mouth and the Holy Spirit is working with that as flawed as we are as pastors mm -hmm. working through that to touch the hearts of people Right. It's a very humbling. Um, it's very, very humbling in itself. Yeah. And, and I think that's that's a good good way to think about it. It's a great way to think about it. But but I, 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 I the one thing I hope people understand about Lutheran preaching, Lutheran sermons is is you mentioned law and gospel there. Um, the sermons aren't there to show us aren't 
to teach us how to be better. The, the sermons are there to actually make us better by Jesus' work on the cross for us. So, so right. the pastor's goal is to deliver the gifts of God through the proclamation of the healing that's won for us by Christ on the cross. And so, so you'll hear the cross. You'll hear um, your sins called out to you, and you'll you'll hear that forgiveness of sins. And so that's that's a, a big part of Lutheran uh, preaching is is to make sure that God's forgiveness is heard by his people. The sense of the word um, is is made and it's made clear that it's an applicable word to our lives here in right. 2022 and whatever year it is. So. Yeah, one of those things I do personally, just because it's uh, I just it's a safeguard for me. It's a safe play as I, you know, I'll unpack the text. I'll apply it as it needs to be the people, whether it's how the people should live or how, you know, the sin problem, whatever that might be. I always end with the gospel. Yeah. I always leave them with the good news of Christ. That's, that's, uh, it's, it's what I do. And I, I'm, many others do also as well. And it's a good practice. Yep. Absolutely. So, well, why don't we call it quits here for now? Um, we'll be back with you guys next time. We'll pick up with the offering. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we're um, going to start out we're going to start out in the valley next time so yeah send all of your tithes and offerings to your local congregation and um we'll uh, we'll get into that next week but uh god be with you if you got any questions about it something we said comments we love to hear them and um we'll look forward to seeing you when we see you all right take care bye